hope seems lost. Beloved, this Sunday morning, I want to continue the, the three-part study and series that we began last month, taken, you remember, from the words of 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that reads and is recorded, now abides or remains faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. From that one verse we have been looking at and we will be looking at what I'm calling the essentials of the Christian life, what it takes to live in these days and times. Last month, you may recall, may recall and may remember, we explored the concept, the principle of faith, how essential it is to the living of our lives. And today, Pop, on this first Sunday in June, I want us to begin to look at the principle of hope. And I want us to look at the theme, the reason I have hope when all hope seems lost. Now, beloved, in order for us to see this and to understand it and to have a ground and even an expectation for it, I think it's important that we listen to verse 11 from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the house of Israel. They are saying, Israel is saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. And beloved, if you and I are honest today, all of us have felt that way at some time or another. And yet the good news, the gospel from Ezekiel 37 is this. You and I still have a reason for hope. Even though it may seem like, it may look like, all hope is gone. In fact, I don't think I would be stretching it much to say that if there is any one thing there is a shortage of in the world today, it's a shortage of hope. Now, I know, I know there's a shortage of a baby formula, baby milk, I know that. I know there's a shortage of gasoline. I, I know I, I, I filled up. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't. I went to fill up. And it was five dollars and some odd cents. So I set a limit. Y'all ain't I would see, obviously I passed a well-off folk. <laughs> Uh, but Lonnie, son, I set a limit. I said, I'm going to put this much in this tank, and I'm going, whatever driving I got to do, it better be enough to cover it. And uh, you know, you know what, see, see, younger people, younger people don't have a real frame of reference. My, my problem, Deacon Gloria Letts, is I'm too old. I remember gas when it was a quarter. <laughs> Come on, but you remember when gas in New York City was 25 cents a gallon. And I stood there yesterday and had to pray because I could not figure out how the same gas. <laughs> it ain't like it's different gas. It, I don't even think it's as good a gas. Was five dollars and some odd cents. With, with, with all the shortages that are in our world today, shortage of hope may be the most predominant. Everywhere we look, people are losing hope. Everywhere we turn, people are abandoning their hope. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, we hear it. I, I listened to our president the other day. My God, I'm praying for him. I should have got a better amen than that. 
I'm, I didn't say I agree with everything. I said I'm praying for him. And before you swell up, I prayed for Mr. Trump. I, I, I look at President Biden and my Mary, I think to myself, I bet he lays in bed at night thinking, what was I thinking about? <laughs> Wanting to be president of these units. And I, I, I bet you First Lady may even punch him sometime in the middle of the night saying, what have you gotten us into? I listened to our president the other night as he begged Congress to pass some sensible yeah, I, I done lost all of y'all. Some sensible gun laws. I, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm not, I don't have time to argue the Second Amendment. And, and, and here's my thing. If, if you want to be a literalist about the Constitution, you don't believe the Constitution is a living, vibrant document that ought to be allowed to adjust to the current contemporary condition. If you want to be a literalist about the Constitution, that it is written and etched in stone, I'm down with you. Let's go for it. And you want to abide by the Second Amendment, the right to bear all, then, then let's be literalists. They were talking about muskets, and I'll buy you all the muskets you want. <laughs> if we can find any, I'll buy you every musket you desire. The, the founding fathers, the framers, did not have AK-47s and assault rifles in mind. Y'all ain't helping me, and since I'm on the roll, just call me butter. And, and I'm so tired of these persons who want to now say we ought to arm the teachers. And these are the same folk who want to take books from teachers because they don't like what's being taught about critical race theory or the history of our nation. My God, don't arm our teachers with guns. Arm them with some books to educate our minds. Can I preach in my own pulpit? I was talking to Brother Mac today on the way in. He was telling me about a program he has. Mac is doing so much good, uh, not just in Reynoldsburg and Pickerington, but throughout the state of Ohio. His whole thing on, on human trafficking has made a difference in the state of Ohio. And he was telling me, he, hey, you ought to applaud Mac. Go ahead. I'll give Mac seven seconds of my time. <laughs> Just done a wonderful job. He was telling me that, that they chastised him for one slide that he had in a presentation that referenced the Bible. And they told him, you can't have that in there in a public school. And I said, I, I was trying to get in the office to get ready. I don't do a whole lot of talking as I'm getting ready. But that thing made me angry. I said, well, ain't that nothing? I said, you go back and tell them I said they want to take the Bible out, but they let guns in. What kind of sense? I wish I had help. Somebody say, bring back the Bible. I think Uncle George ought to start a campaign called the Bring Back the Bible campaign. We ought to get it in our schools. We ought to get it in our library. We ought to get it in Congress. We ought to get it on Broad Street in the state capitol. Yo, because y'all know we done passed this new law that our governor signed that allows young people to carry weapons concealed without any knowledge or any permission. There's something wrong with our state our city, our nation, our world, and folk are teetering, I feel like preaching, and tottering on the brink of hopelessness. COVID wrecked havoc on us. Has it been a million people now? that have died from COVID, this pandemic that's now endemic. Let me just say this, Daryl. The pandemic is not over. Y'all go around sneezing on each other if you want to. <laughs> you want to see me leave a place real quick. I don't care what they do. They could be giving away money. If they in there with no mask on, sneezing and hacking and coughing, the Lord will provide. 
been through the pandemic, it wrecked havoc on our economy, wrecked havoc on our families, wrecked havoc on our jobs, wrecked havoc in our educational system. My God, it was a mess. And then the social upheaval with George Floyd and with Ahmed Aubrey and Sandra Bland, just on and on. We got through that and we struggled through that, holding on to a little bit of hope. And uh, then, my God, Ukraine. And then Buffalo. And then Uvalde. And three other states and cities. You're almost, can I preach? You're almost afraid. Two, two doctors. One of them, an African-American man who went to school with Andy, y'all, Andrea Ewing, Gloria Robinson's daughter, y'all, only that crew over there, no glory. Some of y'all know, Glo know Gloria Robinson. Her, her daughter, Dr. Andrea Ewing, um, who, her married name, Reed, Andrea Ewing Reed, uh, one of the brilliant medical doctors, grew up in this church and I married her, got saved under me, just a lovely lady. She posted that she went to medical school with that doctor. What an affable man. What a, what a, what, what, what a proficient and profound and capable man he was. Killed by a man he tried to help. Who blamed him for chronic pain. God help me. 19 little babies. I, Steve, Sharon, I'm so glad to see y'all over there. Uh, they tell me, I, I'm sorry, they told me that some of those children were so mutilated, their parents had to do DNA samples. Faces blown off. Arms, limbs blown off by those at that assault rifle. We got through the pandemic, and we got through the George Floyd and the Ahmed Aubrey and the Sandra Bland. We got through the long, hot summer. Then we got through Ukraine, kind of, sort of. And then Uvalde and Buffalo, and then all these other states and cities. No wonder people feel hopeless. God help me today. I listened to our president pleading with Congress about it. And, and I thought to myself, listen to his voice. He sounds hopeless. Getting 10 senators from the other party doesn't seem likely. There seems to be no hope for that to happen. That's how polarized we are. Everywhere we turn, preach Clark, doing the best I can with an indifferent, hostile crowd. Everywhere we turn, we see frustration. We see futility. We see fear. People are teetering and tottering on the brink of hopelessness. But thanks be to God, on this Pentecost Sunday, we can declare we have hope. God, I feel like preaching up in here. Would you keep your mask on? Look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I have hope. No, it's not in the economy. I know it's not in that. It's not in the government. I know it's not in that. It's not in my own ability because that ran out a long time ago. My hope is built on nothing less. I wish I had old school folk. Hey, Lee, that Jesus blood and righteousness on Christ. Solid rock I stand. All other ground. Sinking sand. Would you nudge your neighbor and say, I'm getting my hope back? No, no, tell him I'm getting my hope back. If you couldn't tell him I have hope, then say, well, thank God you got it, but I'm, today I'm getting mine back. I'm not going to wallow in despair. I'm not going to wallow in depression. I'm not going to wallow in defeat because I know that my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond anything I can ask, think, or imagine. Look at a neighbor and say, get your hope back. Yeah, grab, in the words of my grandma, grab hold of your hope. <laughs> grab hold of your hope. That's, that, 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 that's what the text is about. Let me hurry. That's what the text is about. The text, my father-in-law said, take my time. The, the text is about a nation 
on the brink of despair. I, I'm amazed. Allow me 14 seconds to parenthetically posture this point. I'm amazed at how contemporary the Bible is. Because Ezekiel 37 is written to a people like America in 2022. Hmm, my Mary, pray, please pray, please, pre please, pretty please pray. Because they have strayed from God. They have abandoned God. They have forsaken God. They paid lip service to God, which is why God said these people draw near me with their mouth, but their heart. You, you can't beat us singing God bless America. You can't beat us reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty. You, you can't beat us putting on our currency in God we trust. We play a good word game, but as a nation, and it's my job, First Lady, as a prophet to, to critique the culture. I am not here to placate the culture and to pacify the culture. I have friends in high places, but I have friendship with them to speak truth into their lives. That's why I won't run for an office. I, no, I got three Larrys in a V right here. That Larry back there. <laughs> Humbly, I say, I could run for any office and win it hands down. I could win it hands down. I know, I know New York politics. Child, Ohio politics is easy. We know New York politics. Gritty, grimy, gutty. <laughs> you know, I belong to a Democratic Party in Harlem. I saw it. Deals cut. Folk cut. <laughs> I don't run because anybody can be a politician, and D, only a few folk can be a prophet. God. I made up my mind years ago, Columbus don't need another politician. Columbus need a prophet. Columbus needs a preacher and a pastor who knows the lingo, who knows the language, who's not intimidated, but ain't looking for nothing. Well, I tell y'all, y'all have made me the most independent black man in Ohio. Because everything I've needed, you as a church have provided. I've never had to go with my hand out begging anybody for anything. Because of you. Give yourselves a hand. Because of you. You've seen to my needs and the needs of my family. So I don't have to capitulate and compromise. Our nation like Israel is on the brink of despair. But Israel in, in Ezekiel 37 is there because of stuff they've done, just like America is where we are because of stuff we've done. This ain't God's fault. This is our fault. We have sown to the wind, Uncle George, and we have reaped the whirlwind. We put God out of our schools. We promoted in media, promiscuity. We made nudity, nudity and lasciviousness commonplace. We've glamorized a lifestyle that is hedonist. It's hedonism. And then we wonder what's wrong with us? Someone said biologically we are sick. Mathematically, we are in error. Musically, we are out of tune. So, Nina, there's something wrong with us at the core of us, at the base of us. And that was Israel in Ezekiel 37. They jacked up. They tore up from the floor up because of stuff they've done. And yet, and yet, and yet, 
chapter 36. That's why you got to read the whole Bible. Chapter 36, God whispers something to them. I'm not through with you. Woo! In chapter 36, he actually tells them, in spite of the mess you've made, I am going to restore you. I don't know why you're still sitting down. You ought to be shouting, spinning like a top. In chapter 36, God says, I am going to restore you. Chapter 37 is not the announcement. Chapter, see, y'all think the announcement is in 37. No, the announcement is in chapter 36. Chapter 37 is the depiction and description of how he's going to do it. Am I teaching y'all anything today? Chapter 36 is the announcement. Chapter 37 is a depiction and description and the definition of how he's going to do it. And he's going to do it two ways. The text breaks down. So simple. You see it. You just don't want to brag. Verses 1 through 14, he says, I will revive them. I will revive them. I wish I had time to preach that. And then verses 15 to 28, he says, and I will reunite them. I'll bring them back. I'll reconcile them. I will revive them, I will reunite them, I will reconcile them, I'll bring them back together again. And beloved, those promises gave hope to the people of Israel. And let me say this, Deacon Snell, in the same way you and I can have hope today, even in the midst of the dark and difficult times in which we live. So let me cut across the field, I see y'all getting bored, let me cut across the field. The relevant question of the day is, and why should people, you up there, you up there all that preaching, that white and red stuff on, you up there doing all that preaching. Why, why should I have hope? I, I watched as much as I could of Uvalde. Why should I have hope? I'm still upset about Buffalo. Why should I have hope? In fact, I ain't got over Mother Emanuel. Why should I have hope? I, I, I still hear George Floyd calling for his mama. Why? Come on, come on, Rev. Come on, stop it. All this preaching you've been doing for 40 years and the world and got worse in the 40 years you've been preaching. And now today on Pentecost Sunday, you want to tell me uh, you can have hope even when all hope seems lost. Please, please. I don't have one to come. My wife makes me come because I'm, I'm about this close to being an atheist. Thank you. I'm about this close to becoming an agnostic. I'm sick of hearing about God in control and all hell is breaking loose. I'm about this close to walking out on you, that church, and on God because it looks like God has been taking a nap the last couple of years. How, 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 you, how, how dare you tell me we still have hope? Well, would you let me argue? If you're going to leave, would you hear me out one last time? I, and let me say, I understand because you this close. I'm about that close sometimes. <laughs> I told God the other day, can I tell you what I told God the other day and y'all still will love me? I told God the other day, I said, I know now what the psalmist meant when he said, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I said, God, we need you to get up and do something. This has to stop. I understand the psalmist. Let God arise. Let God be aroused. And let God scatter the enemy. I understand it. I, my heart, I know. I know. I know how you feel. But I'm not jiving. If you know anything about me, I've never played with you. I've never lied to you. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it. I'd preach something else. I just preach Daniel and the lion's den and the three Hebrew boys in the fire every Sunday so you could shout. But then I would be giving you an opiate. Do I have a church prayer? 
I would be anesthetizing you from the painful reality of the present contemporary situation. And that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to tell you the truth. And the truth is times are hard, days are bad, but God is still God. God, I feel like preaching in my church today. So why, why am I telling you to have hope? I have 14 minutes, 21 seconds. Here's why. First reason. We have hope because God always keeps his word. God always keeps his word. Look at verses 1 through 6. I don't have time to read them. I took too long in an exegesis of the text. So let me just ask you to read when you get home verses 1 through 6. And you will notice that in verses 1 through 6, what is preeminent, prominent, what stands out is God's word. What God says. Here's why. Because, beloved, Christian faith is grounded in God. Let me try it again. Christian, Uncle George, I, I've been calling you and Mama Mary. I've been bothering y'all. I'm sorry. Deacon Skelton, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Christian faith isn't grounded in your pastor. If I ever made you believe that, I apologize. Your faith can't be in me. Now, you can have faith in me as a person, but your faith can't be in me because the arm of flesh will fail you. No, y'all ain't saying nothing. Christian faith is grounded in God. <laughs> but watch this. It's grounded in God because of God's track record. Okay, 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 okay. Pastor Kelly got it. Here it is. I have faith in God because of God's track record. What God has already done. And that's what Israel holds on to. That's what you and I hold on to. God's word. God's track record. The history we have with God. God had promised Israel he was going to bring them out of Egypt. Guess what? He did. He promised them a land of their own. Guess what? He gave it to them. He promised to take care of them even when they were wandering in the wilderness and he gave them water from a rock. He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them shoes that did not wear out. And even when they rebelled against them, he was promising now, I'm still going to deliver you. Okay, y'all didn't get it. Okay, all I'm trying to tell you is that all Israel had to do was go back, run a record on God's history with them, and they would see over and over and over again, God kept his word. And, and I'm going to sit down, preacher, but I tell you, I think if you did it right now, you would look back over your life and you would have to confess God keeps his word. Oh, look how quiet it got. No, God keeps his word, y'all. There is not a promise that God has made to you that he has not broken, that he has broken rather. Everything he said, God will do it. So, 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 reason I have hope is because God always keeps his word. Write these down real quick. That means, A, God anchors us. The word of God anchors us. It gives us a blessed assurance. It assures us that it's going to be all right. What, what, what the late deacon um, Kelly, Mom Kelly, used to say, I got a feeling everything going to be all right. And then watch this, y'all. It abides with us. When everything else is gone, Deacon Scouting, his word, his word remains. Heaven and earth pass away. Vanessa, but his word will abide forever. You can have hope today because God keeps his word. Let me hurry. I have 10 minutes, 18 seconds. We have hope because God is always at work. Look at verses 7 through 10. When you get home, read it. Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I, command, as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. Bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendon and flesh appeared on the bone and skin 
covered them. First of all, God says, you speak to the wind, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the breath, NIV says, and tell the wind, tell the breath to breathe, to blow on these dry bones. He does what God says. Stay with me. And God not only keeps his word, but then God starts working. I wish I had a church right here. Verse 7 through 10 tells us that God performs what he promises in verses 1 through 6. And that's why, beloved, you and I have hope because God is always at work. I'm going to try that one more time, DP. God is always at work. When Israel was in bondage, God was at work. When there was 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testament, God was at work. When Jesus was hanging on a cross, God was at work. And in our history as a people and in our lives as individuals, can somebody holler, God is always at work. That's the only reason we're here. That's the only reason we survive. That's the only reason we're still standing is because in every setting, season, and situation, God is always at work. Hey, God is working when you can't see him. Wow, I believe that with all my heart. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, in fact, I think God does his best work when we sleep so we can leave him alone. <laughs> you, up all, you up bothering God, telling God what to do, how to do, when to do it. God says, go sleep. And while you sleeping, I can finally, it's like your mom used to tell you, go to bed. <laughs> and then when you go to bed, she can clean the house, cook food, do everything. But as long as you up, cat bothering her, she can't do nothing. Sometimes we worry God so much. And God has to work the night shift. <laughs> Y'all get it later on. God is working when we can't see him. B, God is working when things make no sense to us. You know I've learned that, right? You know our family. But our family is not unique. Your family has learned it. When, when, when God makes no sense, he's still working. Your understanding God doesn't equate to when God works. God works when we can't see him. God works when he makes no sense to us. And then here's the one I shouted on in my study. And when God works, nobody can stop him. Okay, y'all didn't get happy. I got happy in my study on that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. When God gets to work, it, can, Pharaoh can't stop him. Hitler can't stop him. Mussolini can't stop him. Herod can't stop him. George Wallace can't stop him. Lester Maddox can't stop him. Pick Boda in South Africa can't stop him. Saddam Hussein can't, okay, y'all don't know none of these names, can't stop him. I wish I had help up here. The Ayatollah can't stop him. The Shah of Iran can't stop him. Edi Amin can't stop him. Your boss who don't like you can't stop him. Somebody hating on you can't stop him. Somebody jealous of you cannot stop him. I, I keep running the list and I'm waiting on you to get happy. It doesn't matter who it is. When God starts working, can't pass the Kelly. I promise they can't stop him. When God gets ready to work on, I don't care if your co-workers plot for you, against you. Can't stop favor. I wish I had some favored folk in just tell a neighbor, you have no idea how I came through the worst hostility, the hatred, the animosity, but favor will blow a hole through the opposition. Favor will let you run through troops and leap over walls. Favor will make a way out of no way. Favor will make your enemies be at peace with you. Favor will make your haters your footstool. Hey, favor will make your foes your friend. Do I have anybody up in here who knows that when God starts working, Mom Edwards can nobody stop it. We have hope. Philip, son, we have hope because God always keeps his word. We have hope, Deacon Gary Croft, because God is always working. Here's the third point. I have five minutes. We have hope because God can and does work wonders. 
Look, look at verses 11 through 14. I don't have time to read it again. But in verses 11 through 14, watch this. What God promised them that day, Uncle George, almost seemed, as the saying goes, too good to be true. God says, Reverend Nan, I'll open the graves of your captivity. I will resurrect you. Why y'all still sitting here? And cause you to live again. I will bring you back home, settle you in your own land. And then watch this. Then you will know that I am the Lord. <laughs> Oh, I wish I was an older preacher. I'd preach it like an older preacher could preach it. Listen, to me. I'll open up the grave of your captivity. I'll resurrect you from your dead state. I'll cause you to live again, and I'll bring you back home and settle you in the land you got evicted from. I don't know why. It must be the folk online who are shouting with me, Osaze, Sister Tammy, Sister Maureen. Anybody online want to shout that God is still able to do the impossible? Okay, I feel like preaching right there. Is there anybody here who knows that God is able to do what others could not conceive, could not imagine, could not comprehend? He said, I'm going to open your graves. The stuff that had you bound, that was a grave for you. I'm going to open up the grave of your captivity. In fact, would you look at a neighbor say, neighbor, my assignment today is to loose you and let you go <laughs> and not what, what what Jesus told those folk at the tomb of Lazarus when Lazarus came out of the tomb the Bible says he was wrapped and bound in grave clothes and Jesus said loose him and let him go would you tell I know see some of y'all too honorary to say anything just look if you don't want to say it use sign language and say my assignment today is to loose you and let you go because he says I'm gonna open up your grave I'm gonna resurrect you I'm going to cause you to live. I'm going to bring you back into your home, settle you in your own land so you will know that it's not the government. Hey, Lee Land, it's not your Medicaid or your Medicare. It's not your 401B. It's not your IRA. But I am the Lord your God because there are some things that only God can do. And beloved, that's where our hope is today. That's where our faith is today. It's in a God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond anything we can ask or imagine. It's what the old folk used to say, that God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. He plants his feet upon the sea and rides on every storm. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, he's a wonder worker. He's a wonder worker working God and I gotta close I got one minute and 23 seconds when I tell you God does wonders for his people God does wonders to fulfill his promise but hey y'all God does wonders so he gets praise the reason why he makes a way out of no way the reason why he fights your battle and gives you victory is when the storm is over and the battle is over you won't give yourself the credit but you tell everybody if it had not been I feel like preaching for the Lord on my son when my enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh they stumbled and they fell though a host should rise against me my heart shall not fear in this will I be confident one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion he shall set me up upon a rock and now come on work with me Winston and now 
now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Come on, Winston. And now I shall offer sacrifice to the Lord. Come on, Winston. And now I shall rejoice in the God. One more time. And now let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I feel like preaching on Pentecost Sunday. Can I wrap it all up? You know how all that happened? On Pentecost Sunday, Ezekiel 37, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the breath, the ruach, that's just another word for the spirit. The only way it happened was the spirit of God fell on those bones. Is there anybody here who says we need a fresh baptism? We need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh infilling. We need a fresh encounter with the Holy Ghost. I double dog dare you online. Throw back your head and say, let the fire. Uh, let the fire fall on me the fire of pentecost consuming sin and dross let the holy fire from heaven fall on me with your spirit fill me lord possess me now i pray souls are dying every day make me Holy thine, I pray, with, with, with thy spirit. With thy spirit. somebody I want more of his spirit with thy spirit fill me make me holy thine I pray with your spirit fill me Ezekiel 37 happens only because the breath of God the spirit of God, the ruach of God falls on those dry bones. They said to God, we are dry, dead bones. All hope is lost, is gone. And God says, really? You don't know me. I specialize in things that seem impossible. We live in hopeless days. Some people right now only see a hopeless end. 
But those of us who know Christ see endless hope. I want everyone standing because I'm going to pray with you. I'm going, hey, Winston, we got to go old school. My hope is built original way, original way, no modifications.